Hello. Today I'm speaking with Sir Richard Blundell from University College London. Professor Blundell is visiting Sergei to present his new paper on human capital and welfare reform. Tell us about your seminar paper. Uh, what are the long-term impacts of these welfare programs? Does welfare change whether people stay on at school or not? Uh, you can imagine there's two reasons why that might happen. One is if you can get welfare, um, uh, then there's less incentive to um, get educated, to get a higher income, possibly. Um, that's one obvious effect. The other is uh, a bit more subtle, and that is that um, there's kind of two ways of avoiding uh, very low incomes in life. Uh, one is to get educated because it, it just keeps your earnings up during your lifetime. Of course, uh, the other is, is welfare itself. And uh, if you're risk averse, which people typically are, then uh, welfare can also provide a kind of insurance. And uh, we find both those matter. And there's a little impact on, um, on education choices. The other thing we look at, though, which is perhaps um, even more important, is, um, is the accumulation of human capital in work. And so what you typically call that is experience capital. And uh, the idea being uh, that um, when you're in work, you accumulate some uh, human capital about the job or about work. And uh, what we find there is that, in fact, that only really matters for people who have some relative Uh, high amounts of education, formal schooling. So people who leave schooling early don't seem to accumulate much human capital on the job and in fact welfare doesn't really make much difference to that. You've done a lot of research on consumption inequality. So what's the empirical evidence on the sources of this income and consumption inequality? Generally uh, consumption has been somewhat underexplored And it's interesting for two reasons. One is um, if, people, if people face fluctuating income from uh, year to year, it may be that to some extent they can get round those fluctuations through their borrowing or saving um, or other, other what you could call insurance uh, mechanisms, but let's just say through the credit market. In fact, for, for richer people, um, when they get a a drop in their income, uh, if it's a relatively temporary drop, uh, then uh, they can probably get by with the savings they have. Or, or um, For poorer people, they might be able to get by borrowing from friends or, uh, or through the welfare system or something like that. But typically for poorer people, they don't have so much access to credit. And, uh, and so credit isn't going to be the natural thing for them to use. Uh, but of course consumption in some ways covers all of that because if uh, they can borrow from friends or the welfare system that means they can keep their consumption up but if they can't use credit then they can't um, they can't insure through uh, the credit market as much as they they would like to for richer people perhaps their income fluctuations exaggerate the uh, volatility in in their really well-being and so consumption gives you a bit more of a longer run view of inequality uh, than these other shorter run uh, income uh, measures. And uh, that's been uh, an important consideration there. So what brings you to Surge EI? No, uh, it's, uh, it's great to be back in uh, Surge EI. Um, I was uh, actually on the advisory, uh, advisory uh, committee here Um, uh, in the early 2000s and I've really uh, enjoyed watching um, Surge EI develop and flourish into a really active and um, very nice intellectual home for economics and economics research and it's great to be back.